Any questions on uh, thyroid or pituitary disorders? Any questions on that stuff from last time that was nice and exciting? Um, did I? Yeah, I covered a lot of slides last time. So. <laughs> Everybody's 100% competent with hypothyroidism. Oh. What questions do you have? Of course, okay. Assessment? Assessment? Yes. Get more specific. I mean, I don't just have to know just that we know how to assess it and like size and it's just that it's not supposed to. Assessing the thyroid? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, know how to assess the thyroid. How? How to calculate it? Yeah. 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 But we're not. Yeah. Not there's the two. Side. There's two sides of the thyroid. This right. is in the middle. And you palpate it. Usually you would stand next to the patient, or you would stand behind them and palpate. Yeah. Right. Swallow. And you feel. Normally the, the thyroid is not palpable, uh, but if you can feel the thyroid, it's probably more. <laughs> I have a question about uh, hyperthyroidism. It's a disturbed sensory perception related to cor corneal dryness. Right, and that's because of the exophthalmus that comes along with it. The eyelids, you may not close very easily, or may not at all. It pours them down. The eyes get very dry. You have a corneal abrasion. You have a, and then the dry eye the drives your eye. Your vision is okay. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Did you figure out your question, Brian? No. Okay. All right. So um, let's talk about uh, thyroiditis. And thyroiditis is inflammation of the thyroid, right? For some reason. This is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And um, it is an autoimmune uh, thyroiditis. And um, for some reason, the body produces antibodies that attack the thyroid tissue. Um, and because of that, it creates scar tissue, fibrous tissue on the thyroid. Uh, and decreases the function of the thyroid because it becomes infiltrated with scar tissue, which, of course, does nothing. All right? um, and that because of the scar tissue, also you would have an enlarged thyroid. So see, this lady has an enlarged thyroid. Mm -hmm. um, after, um, I, I didn't pay much attention to the thyroid before I went to NP school, but after I assess everybody's thyroid, I'm not. It's just, you know, as nurses, what we do is you, you assess. When you see somebody, you, you assess them. It's just kind of what you will eventually do if you don't already do that. And so one of the first things that I do when I look at the person is just look at their neck. I don't know. So, uh, <laughs> you, should, you know, you just, you just scan the person. So the thyroid looks good. You know, like I have, sometimes I have patients, people bring their kids into the clinic and the, the parents are like, is that thyroid in there? I don't know. You know. Um, or yeah, I have thyroid issues, but anyway, so it's to me it's very obvious. Um, so again, you know, with with um, decreased function of the thyroid, you would have low T3 and T4 because that is thyroid hormone. So the thyroid doesn't produce as much thyroid hormone. And goiter simply, you know, is the enlargement of the thyroid. It can be masses on the thyroid too, like tumors. All right. Any questions about that? Of course, you know, we would diagnose it with a physical exam, you know, with the goiter, but also measure the TSH, T3, T4, which, you know, would be opposite with these disorders. The anti-thyroid hormones, did I spell that one? Anyway, um, at least you know I make these slides. I don't pull them out of, you know, <laughs> from Google, you know. Um, so, anyhow, so the anti-thyroid, that should actually say anti-thyroid antibodies. Um, so it measures the antithyroid antibody because remember it's autoimmune, and that if that was would be if that's positive, that's very indicative of a diagnosis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So treat and prevent hypothyroidism, um, and because if you know if we give Synthroid, that's synthetic T3, right? And um, if we give it as a supplement, the thyroid is not going to try to produce it as much. It's going you know it's going to slow down its activity, so therefore that can help shrink the size of it. Does 
that it's not trying to produce more. It's not overactive. Then there's just acute thyroiditis. This is normally viral. With Hashimoto's, you have manifestations of hypothyroidism. With acute thyroiditis, you have manifestations of hyperthyroidism. And again, that enlarged thyroid, it, you can never say it's hypo or hypo. It can happen in both. Right. This is a, the, the thyroid here is tender. The inflammation causes the neck to be warm and sometimes red. Right. Initially, you have manifestations of hyperthyroid, but as you have uh, several flares of this, the thyroid becomes damaged and then is unable to produce enough T3, T4. Initially hyper, if not prevented, and you have many uh, uh, recurrences, you can go into a hypo state. Because it's viral, you know, there's most likely it's viral. There, we wouldn't use antibiotics. We would give medications to decrease inflammation which is part of the inflammatory response, aspirin, steroids. This is also a, a uh, inflammation of the thyroid, but usually this is not caused by a viral or a bacterial cause. It's often seen um, postpartum. And it can lead to Hashimoto's thyroiditis. That's why it says early Hashimoto's. I spelled it right there. So is that what it would be considered once you've had repeated occurrences and inflammation has occurred? Yeah, and like um, I said, they'll measure those antithyroid antibodies, and if those are positive, it's Hashimoto's. I don't know why I can make a guess, but um, uh, you know because the person who is pregnant is considered immunocompromised, um, so that might lead to an autoimmune problem. That would be my best, best guess. Sounds good, right? But that will not be on the test. Um, so, yeah. And then here you may have maybe earlier you, it would be hyperthyroid, and then later it would be hypothyroid because um, it, it alternates and the inflammation would cause the um, hypostate and then after or hyperstate and then as it progresses to Hashimoto's remember it, it's hypo size. Does that make sense? You see how sparse these slides are, right? Alright. Thyroid tumors, also known as coiters. So we talked about that, the swelling in the neck. Maybe you'll be a better assessor now of a thyroid because I told you that I always look at somebody's neck. Um, but um, simple goiter, that means that the patient doesn't have any manifestations related to this enlarged thyroid. So this person is in a euthyroid state. Uh, and probably the cause of this is that the patient is not getting enough iodine. Like I said, normally asymptomatic, they're euthyroid. But it's just the, the swelling of the thyroid, and um, if there's lots of swelling, it can displace those structures in the neck, in the mediastinum, and possibly cause tracheal compression. Make sure that this patient, um, when they are using table salt, that it is fortified with iodine. That's why our table salt is fortified with iodine, to prevent it from having thyroid issues. A toxic goiter is a goiter that has manifestations, <clears throat> usually hyperthyroidism. A nodular goiter is just an enlarged goiter again. That is, but nodular means that it's not enlarged overall. It has kind of like um, nodules in it, bumps and lumps, if that makes sense. It's, it's, a, it's lumpy, yeah. Generally asymptomatic, generally euthyroid. All right. So with these that don't cause any manifestations, our main priority 
is to make sure that the airway remains normal. Right, toxic has manifestations. And is usually connected to hyperthyroidism. There is cancer of the thyroid. There are a couple of main types, papillary and follicular. The most important thing here, I think, to remember is which one is um, uh, worse to have. So the follicular adenocarcinoma, the thyroid, is more aggressive. Papillary can metastasize, but usually it remains in the lymph system and it's not as aggressive during metastasization. Often they'll just take the thyroid out if there's cancer, take a part of it out, maybe even half of it, it's all that needs to be taken out. Um, I used to work with a nurse and he had thyroid cancer and um, and his the his his symptom was that he had a rubbery, weird feeling thyroid, and that actually there the tumor was displaced below his clavicle. So every once in a while it would pop up. And it would be really scary. And then it would go back down behind his clavicle. So he eventually got it checked out. And he had probably um, um, uh, papillary in the carcinoma. Um, what do you mean to say it feels rubbery? It's kind of spongy, rubbery. It's not hard. It's more pliable. I mean, I've never felt thyroid cancer. But when I think of rubbery, it's like it's a rubber ball. Like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Um, but he had a thyroidectomy, now he's on support. And the, the surgeon um, uh, told him that the best type of cancer, if you ever get cancer, is thyroid cancer. Because you just take the thyroid out and there's no problem. Nobody's wishing for cancer, but if you get a cancer, <laughs> thyroid's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, radiation and chemotherapy can be used for this is a nice little chart here. Um, so just by far the most common type of cancer is papillary uh, thyroid cancer. So they both can be in the with your cell? Mm -hmm. So basically these are very similar, right? Uh, but this is more common. some practice questions. Read the first one. The patient has hyperthyroidism. Which lab result would the nurse least expect to be elevated? Well, that kind of makes it a little more difficult, doesn't it? TSH, right? Mm -hmm. There's a couple of ways that you can go about this question. Because right now it seems pretty simple, but on the test it would trick people. Um, because the first thing that you could do was you could maybe say which of these is not like the other, right? That's TSH, right? Because T4, T3, and free T4 are uh, thyroid hormones, and TSH is a pituitary hormone, right? But also, um, um, with hyperthyroidism, you have elevated thyroid hormones. Right, low TSH. It's a negative feedback mechanism. Right. The second one. The patient has severe thyrotoxicosis, which is also known as what? Thyroid storm. Right. One of those signs of thyroid storm is high fever. We want to try to get the temperature down. Which of these interventions is least appropriate? So between aspirin and Tylenol. I thought aspirin did like decrease. Aspirin decreases thyroid hormone. 
Yeah, so you wouldn't give that. This person has hyperthyroidism. Yeah, so oh, well, you and aspirin mm -hmm. increases. Aspirin increases yeah. thyroid. Yeah. So, yeah. so you would have given that. Exactly. Right. Right. Well, how do I just the least say? appropriate yeah. is aspirin. A least. Man, it's true. The least all the time. All <laughs> Do not see least ever. <laughs> Both of those were negative stem questions. This one's, I was in a negative stem mood that day. Let's say this is also a negative stem. Mood. So the patient's in a myxedema coma. What this is asking is which of these patients is most likely to have mixed DNA. Mm -hmm. Right, so first you would ask yourself, is it men or women it's more common in? Mm -hmm. It rules out A and B pretty much, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you ask yourself, the person has hypothyroidism, so they're heat or cold intolerant? Cold, cold, cold intolerant, so men women, right? Elderly woman and then woman. Central diabetes insipidus, that's usually from a head injury, right? Um, and what elevated lab test would be expected? Right, it's D. Because this person is what? Dehydrated, right? They're urinating off all of their fluid because they have deficient antidiuretic hormone. So their ABH would be uh, low, right? Mm -hmm. Urinosmolality, low. This is about where you're in, right? Yes. Yeah. So therefore, if you're peeing off lots of fluid, the serum, the blood, is going to become concentrated. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's the, the C option, if serum sodium would be right, right? Urine sodium is not right. Right, right. This is an evaluation question. So the patient is on the synthroid. Which statement basically is true? <clears throat> right, the best answer is C, but why is the best answer C? Because you're giving them signs of hyperthyroidism. Right, you're giving them thyroid hormone. If you have signs of hyperthyroidism, that might indicate the patient's getting too much simple. Mm -hmm. Good. Let's talk a little bit about parathyroid. So um, this big thing here is the thyroid gland, right? But the parathyroid glands are embedded into the thyroid gland. Usually there's four, um, and the purpose of these is to produce parathyroid hormone. It has mostly to do with the um, movement of calcium. So it regulates the movement of calcium between the blood and the bones. Also vitamin D is an issue here. And it also acts in the kidneys to uh, excrete or resorb uh, calcium. This is a nice old fact here, but just to realize that 99% of your calcium is in your bones. Only 1% is in your See, I already said that renal reabsorption of calcium and excretion of phosphorus because you remember that phosphorus and calcium are opposite, right? Um, promotes absorption of calcium from bones. So if the calcium is low in the blood, the parathyroid hormone is released, 
and pulls a little bit of calcium from the bone to restore serum calcium. Because if we have low serum calcium, we have big problems. Cardiac, right? Um, also, it has to do with the conversion of, of, uh, of vitamin D. Uh, and remember that we need vitamin D in order to use calcium. For calcium to be uh, transferred to the bone, vitamin D must be around. The majority of the population is deficient in vitamin D. Because we don't go outside. Huh? Why is that? Because we don't go outside. It's because we don't go outside. We have bad diets, and lots of us are overweight. Your um, uh, body requires more vitamin D when you're overweight. So a lot of people like to use the excuse that you know it's because we uh, we just don't go outside. Well, that's probably not because um, uh, it only takes, I think, 20 to 30 minutes per day of direct sun exposure on your face and up on, on your arms to get enough sun um, to produce enough vitamin D. It's other reasons. And we can just relate it back to, you know, we're just fat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It was funny. I was talking with... Um, the physician that I work for, she said, I think we just need to change the level of vitamin D because everyone is like, who decided this was a normal range? You know, uh, I don't know. Um, so, uh, but, but again, I think I already said this, but if you have a low serum calcium, all right, PTH, parathyroid pulls that calcium in, right? Good. These are the levels that you need to know. Total calcium is the total serum calcium, and that's the number that you're used to remembering, about 8 to 10. Um, when you see something that is ionized, there are other things that we measure that are ionized in calcium, but ionized calcium is the amount, it's the calcium in the blood that is ionized, but that means that it is ready to be used. So if anything had, is ionized, meaning that it has a charge, if you're taking chemistry, it can be bound to something else. So therefore, if the calcium is not ionized, then it has already bound to protein. But the ionized calcium tells us how much calcium is in the blood that can be used. Active, if that makes sense. Correlated with free T4. Right, but free T4 is the, the kind, if you think of it the same way, you can it can be used. All right. Take yourself back to the foundations and um, remember all those signs of hyper and hypocalcemia. And, uh, well, maybe not all of them, but the most important ones, the most common ones. Um, and also, um, I said it last time, what was it? Sodium that was important, right? I don't even want to get into this. We've got. Two more days. Y'all just want to not do hyperparathyroid today. Sure. <laughs> I will if somebody really wants to do it. I, I think. <laughs> um, but we've got two more lectures, so um, just take it easy, right? Yes. Good okay with y'all. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I can. But when you come, when we come back in a couple of weeks, make sure that you're pretty good at already knowing this. And one thing that's pretty important to know how to assess with hypo with hypo is this Trousseau's and Chibos test. Make sure that you are very familiar with how to do that. Uh, right. Mr. Sash, yeah. Uh, you think you promised last time that you would put up the, uh, <laughs> the lectures? You want lecture three? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and four. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. Okay. We'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> I put it all over. Test four stuff.